welcome to this episode of Talking Kotlin. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Seb, I think you should do the intro. Oh, Very we could just do that. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll stick with that. That that's a good intro, right? I mean, sure. I really did that well. It was so energetic and wonderful. <laughs> It's uh, <laughs> we'll fix it in post, I think. No, let's not fix it, let's just leave it as is. Uh, great, uh, this is what happens after uh, five days off where you don't, you're not really off, and then yeah, I shaved my hair. Do you see? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's maybe that's the issue. Yeah, maybe the little brain I had is gone. How are you doing, Seb? I'm doing great. You know, how to, here's a here's a fun fact about uh, YouTube statistics. Most viewers decide whether they want to watch a video within the first 30 seconds. So I think we got that covered now. Anyone who who's stuck around by now, by by this time, Mark, uh, is probably a true fan anyway, and probably well, appreciates the weather segment as well. Uh, well, let me tell you another YouTube stat, uh, which I recently found out. Uh, there's a uh, there's a guy by the name of uh, James Stephen Donaldson. Ever heard of him? I can't think. He may go. Uh, folks that have kids may have heard of him. He goes by the name Mr. Beast. Oh, uh, he's a famous YouTuber. Yeah. And uh, apparently he started to gain a lot of subscribers and go viral because he did a video where he counted to 100,000. Now, just before we joined this live broadcast, which is not live because you're watching a recording, we had to each count to like 20 <laughs> for sound check. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm putting two and two together. Why don't we do like a talking Kotlin where we just count? Between the guests, like I say one, then you, Ivan, say two, David, you say three, Seb, you say four, and then we go on like that, reach 100,000, and we'll go viral. That sounds like an excellent idea, and also a great way to actually introduce uh, today's guests. Uh, yeah, so today we're joined by uh, Ivan and David, who work on HTTP 4K. Hey, folks. Good morning. Hello. So yeah, uh, what do you like? What do you think about the idea of just counting to to like a hundred thousand? <laughs> well, it sounds like a challenge. I mean, you know, it's um, yeah. But I mean, this is YouTube, right? So if it's YouTube, I do I need, do we not need to sell you on some kind of investment platform first? How I, I made a hundred thousand dollars in the first twenty minutes. That seems, seems I, to be all the thing I get. What, on what YouTube. David I mean, all the way to make charity. it more clickable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, every time I see a shitty B four K, I'm like. I I, so I can't get over this. Like every single time I see HTTP 4K written down, I keep thinking HTTP UHD. Like, <laughs> it, it just have you considered renaming? Um, not yet, no. But the problem uh, is that what will happen is a new video format will be along next week. So we there don't you wanna... go. You, you, yeah. You're innovating every single year. There you go. Yes. A, it's One day we're gonna be vintage. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, before we move on to HTTP 4K and get updates from you folks, important news, breaking news, weather segment. Seb, how's it been on your end of the? Uh, you know, I can't I give you what. historical data because I actually just landed back in Germany uh, yesterday. Um, we were out for a for a conference, um, but right now uh, it's much colder uh, than I would like it to be. Uh, at least in in the daytimes, uh, there's a bit bit of clouds going on. I do like it though because I always sleep with an open window, uh, no matter the temperature. Um, wow, you don't have mosquitoes in Munich? N well, not at these temperatures. No, like wow. it's it's like 15, fifteen, fourteen degrees. So yeah, yeah, it's gotten cold here. In Madrid, was massive floods uh, yesterday. Like they were on red alert. Everyone was so excited because they've Im they've implanted this. Uh, you know, this uh, alert system in Spain now where they can send an alert to any mobile phone without oh. knowing the number. So everyone was more excited about having received this alert and the government <laughs> like, look, the alert system works. <laughs> then, you know, half of the buildings collapsing in Madrid uh, because oh of my. the flood. So, yeah, uh, it was a red alert uh, there. No, so, but here it's getting a little bit cooler, which I'm happy about as well, which is, which is great. And we had one day of rain which will allow us to in light of the new water restrictions coming up i guess we can flush the toilet twice now <laughs> now that's luxury right there 
<laughs> exactly. So anyway, talking about no, I'm not going to say talking about toilets. Let's, let's talk about HTTP 4K because that that even for that is like that's not a tangent. Um, anyway, yes, let's get back to HTTP 4K. So. Ivan, David, obviously you folks have been on the show before. I think it was about two years ago. So um, how have things been since then? Uh, Ivan? Well, uh, we still have been keeping the pace of more than a re I'm averaging a release a week. So there's plenty of work been going on in the last two years. Um, we recently reached the 1 million downloads a month uh, mark. Wow. From Congratulations. Maven. So, Congratulations. Uh, so I think the uptake is, is in steadily increasing, which is really good. Uh, and we'll be adding all sorts of different modules. Uh, Dave can give some examples here for us. Uh, yeah, so actually there were two, two new ones went over the weekend, actually. So now we're up to 131 uh, across the two various projects. Um, so, yeah, I mean, pretty much in the last couple of years, it's kind of been more to do with... Um, We've done more of the Lambda stuff or more of the serverless stuff. So now there are six platforms. I think we've now got 20 backend servers now we can choose from, including the Loom ones and like Jetty and the new Sun HTTP uh, one we've got with Loom. And then I think we've been we've done some HTTP K Connect, which is our um, kind of connectivity library for adapters. Um, we've added some OpenAI stuff because, you know, it's OpenAI. So, you know, it's 2023, you got to do it. Got to do that AI stuff, right? So uh, just to keep in in with the kids, um, I think Playwright. So, so for folks that aren't too familiar, as I said, we've got a show that that we recorded a couple of years ago, and we'll add the links to this show, of of course. Uh, just give us a for folks that are listening new, just a brief summary of what HTTP 4K is, so that we're all on the same page. Yeah, I, I can take that one. Uh, so. HP4K project we started six years ago, uh, mainly to, at the time, we were already using Kotlin. We started using Kotlin before 1.0. So uh, we wanted, uh, building already microservices at that time, we wanted to have something uh, simple and native in Kotlin to build those microservices. Uh, at the time, uh, there were new things popping up, like Wasabi was still uh, a thing at that time. Uh, was Ktor was around going at the same time uh, and they've already had experience with this idea of server as a function and we basically wanted to transport that to Kotlin so that's what we did with H4K where we could have maximum testability by representing HTTP calls just using uh, a function that gets a request and returns a response so that's the nutshell of H4K uh, and with this function we start composing to more complex things that led into Lambda, different server backends, uh, templatings, open, uh, open API, OAuth, uh, and, and so on. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's my summary. I don't know if they have I missed anything. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, yeah, we just tend to build stuff that we find is useful. That's the thing. So we go to project to project to project. I mean, we're both independent consultants, so we kind of like we've seen various bits and pieces, and we can talk about the places we've used it in, in a minute. But um, generally, when we come across a thing, it's oh, we need some old stuff. We build some old stuff, and into the library it goes, and then we continue. So, and it just kind of snowballs from there. Is how we've managed to gain various twenty-seven, but twenty server backends and six different JSON libraries and five different templating libraries and different ham hamcrest and co-test and strict matches. Just we tend to kind of just it's like a gathering ball of stuff that just continues to to, to kind of uh continue on into the into the uh into the distance i suppose well i i feel like at least through the as you said you you heavily modularize your app so at, at least i guess you're you're keeping that that ball of stuff uh manageable for for people yeah, absolutely. I mean, most of the most of the modules are just a couple of hundred lines of code, really. I think the most complicated one is the Open API stuff, but there's there's quite a lot of generation of of the actual Open API specs. So there's a lot of kind of custom code in there, but I think that's the most uh, terrifying bit as well. That's the bit the bit of code I like to go into least because it's quite hairy. Um, the specs not easy. I think that goes 
probably into the strength of whatever underlying ab abstraction you've uh, you've chosen if if you can really say like oh most functionality uh we can we can implement within the the context of like uh one module and it usually ends up just being a couple hundred lines that's actually really exciting uh that's really cool i'm i'm curious uh is it just uh you ivan and david working on http 4 k or do you have other contributors as well uh, the, the core team, I would say, is probably the two of us. Uh, actually, in terms of output, I'd say that is mostly Dave. Uh, I would say it's like in contributions to the code, Dave takes the lead uh, and I help here and there. Uh, but we have, I think, over 100 people who contributed with different modules and keep submitting pull requests uh, every every day. It's, it's like people say, if if you if you need a new support, something else, like a new backend, for example, it's just a few hundred lines of code, anyone can actually create something new in H4K as well. We have to support. So there are, I, I think it's fair to say there are modules that we barely touched and are mostly driven by contributors, right, Dave? Um, yeah, so I think, so there's a, a guy called Albertage. He did he did the toolbox. Um, so that that was our kind of, uh, kind of um, it's the kind of uh, wizard that allows you to generate projects. That, that was a really good bit of code. Uh, people like Duncan, uh, Refactoring Duncan, you know, Duncan McGregor, um, he does quite a lot of inspiration for our stuff. And and the other thing is, I think that, you know, people have learned to play to our uh, egos a little bit. So it's like, oh, if it doesn't do this, it's like, well, give me a couple of minutes and it will do. So, you know, kind of, and, and thus new modules are born when I get annoyed that it can't do something. <laughs> so with all these modules that you have, how do you address discoverability for users and uh you know i mean your i mean not not only the fact of discoverability but how do users manage projects that have to add maybe 50 or 60 modules um so we have a bomb so which has got so it's basically split into two bits there's the main of h4k which is like the core and then there's connect and it's kind of 50 50. um I think most of all, people tend to pick one of a particular type of thing. They've only got one templating engine. They've only got one JSON engine. They've only got one server. So they kind of tend to kind of, I mean, and that's actually the way we've gen with, um, the way we've structured the wizard is like, okay, what templating engine? You want that one? What back end? That one, that one, that one. So pretty much um, all, as much as possible, we try and keep the interfaces consistent. So swapping one thing out like a server engine is one line of code it's like change change one line in your in your dependencies and then it's one line of code yeah i, I think it's also also worth explaining the difference between h3.4k and h4k connect uh like the, we have connect as a separate monorepo with separate modules because it, it's basically about integration with well-known apis like aws github and so on so if you're starting a new service, you can use the wizard and you can choose, I'm going to use this templating. Do I want to have open API? Is that going to be deployed on serverless or undertow or so on? But then as you start developing, you say, oh, I need to talk to GitHub API or I need to um, talk to AWS particular service. Then you basically pick and choose from those. And for both of them, we have the bomb, uh, which you can just like autocomplete pretty much what are the things you can do. Uh, that's, uh, I think a really good, uh, approach overall. Um, you said you use a bomb, so a bill of materials, I guess that makes it easier for people who use, for example, Gradle or whatever build system. Um, and I guess it also means that even if you have a, a lot of packages that you depend on, uh, you don't have to like repeat the version number over and over again. You, you just kind of get one set of the libraries. Um, that are that are consistent, which I think it's it's one of the one of the greatest uh, one of the greater things because I think this despite I, I think it sometimes being a little bit misplaced, people have a little bit of Gradle phobia where the the more things in in Gradle and their build scripts they have to change, um, the the scarier it gets for them. Uh, so it's it's nice having like a a, a single a single toggle for where where you manage those uh, those version numbers if they're if they're all connected anyway. What's wrong with multiple cursors? <laughs> I guess that's one way of of doing uh, build tools. What's wrong with search and replace? You know the good old <laughs> refactorings. 
Yeah. And even the bill of materials started from our own needs because we we are already using these in, in different projects and we are strong believers in frequent small upgrades. So we are releasing constantly uh, improvements to H4K. Uh, managing each individual module separately will be a nightmare. So we are happy to just we use the change log heavily to say in this new version, these are the modules that have been updated, but the version number goes to all of them. I, th I think it's probably worth saying something here about uh, documentation as well, which is we 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 believe in like working code of documentation over over just static documentation. So all of the code that you see on the website is actually in the it's source code that's then compiled in. So if we refactor or rename, it automatically it, you know kind of takes effect immediately in in the documentation as well. I think that's really important because the outdated documentation is just you know rage inducing really so it's you know having things that are not kind of compiled in is like it was a real no-no so i think that's it. yeah we do that with a lot of our projects as well but at first when you said uh, we believe in uh in code over documentation I, I was thinking well that's a lame excuse not to write docs <laughs> but i mean like that's the yeah no but uh that is the most frustrating thing for users right when you when they're trying something and they read the documentation and then they try it with the latest version it doesn't compile and it gives some um, unknown uh property so yeah that that's one of the best things that we could do like make sure that the docs are compiling in fact um, another matter is whether they run and work that's that's beside the point uh so yeah but uh i wanted to discuss a little bit uh you know Again, we've we've done the technical stuff to a certain extent, um, and we invited you back on this show because you were awarded with uh, one of the three prizes of the was it three or five? I should know. I I announced them. Um, one of the prizes that the Kotlin Foundation gave out to contributors to Kotlin multi-platform libraries or frameworks, um, and you were one of the winners. Uh, so, how did you feel about uh, that? Yeah. Well, clear. Well, of course, we really appreciate the recognition. I think it's great to see that um, we are recognized as like uh, valuable uh, projects uh, in the community. Um, it also gives like a, a boost of yes. Now there's more things that we can look at that people will be expecting which I think is always good. Um, how that gonna translate to actual changes to the project, as I think is yet to be seen and be happy to discuss and see everyone's opinion here. But um, I think it's really good to see companies like JetBrains and the Kotlin Foundation um, incentivizing um, open source projects to keep evolving, keeping giving back to the community. Uh, and that takes me to the next question, which is, you said that you're both independent consultants, right? Uh, how do you sustain the work that you do on HTTP 4K? Is it all through your consultancy? Uh, yeah, um, so, yeah, so we mostly, well, most of it's, it's kind of 50% labor of love, I suppose. Um, I think we, we mentioned last time when we were on, like, HTTP 4K, to a certain extent, was born out of a frustration with the uh, us wanting to have something that we wanted to use and, you know, so there's, we, that we would find useful. So that's first and foremost, it's that, you know, we, we built it for us and it's just really great that everyone else is getting to, getting to use it as well. Um, so over the years, we've kind of managed to get, I mean, it's interesting that now we kind of get hired because we do h 5 k And so instead of, so now that's kind of like what we're known for. So, so to a certain extent. Uh, so that's really great as well. So it kind of plays back in that kind of in that kind of professional business to business sense as well that we you know we brought on as consultants in order to advise people on how to use it. Um, but we have actually we've we've had a GitHub sponsors thing going for for a while. Um, but we actually managed to we've got a kind of corporate kind of partnership with a company called Spring Nature who were like uh, we've got really close ties with. Um, they were they were kind of heavily uh, supportive of us kind of kind of creating and like using it within their um uh within their their projects when we rebuilt their channel platform and i think you had like nat, nat and duncan on a few uh a couple of years ago and that when they nat was saying oh we were using kotlin before it was between beta and what 1.0 uh 
Um, and so, yeah, and that was very much a kind of a driving force in us being able to use cotton in the first place. So I think, you know, all these things kind of come together, you know, we've got like, Nat comes in with the idea and then we were building on top of, you know, other people's ideas. We're always building on the shoulders of giants, right? So, so you know, the, the Twitter paper and like the, 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 the system we were using before, which was called Us Be Idle. And you know, so all these things kind of build in and we just, all we do is kind of like, you know, we iterate on other people's good work. And hopefully people will iterate on us, you know, when, when eventually we're old and grey and don't want to do anything. Yeah. But but I think it's fair to say that our funding for H4K is, is still indirect through consulting of teams that hired us to help them deliver software and help them solve their problems, basically. Gotcha. Um, and that uh, Twitter paper that you were uh, referencing to, I think that's one we also mentioned in the previous uh, episode, which was the your your server as a function, which kind of lays the some of the foundational ideas that I guess have also flown into HTTP4K. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm I'm curious though because as Hadi just mentioned, uh, the uh, the grant was specifically also for for libraries in the ecosystem that did something on the on the multi platform side. Uh, I'm not sure if we've discussed this the last time, but especially now that we have of course more and more uh, adoption of multi platform and it's well on its way to towards stabilization. Uh, I'm I'm curious what the what the relationship between Kotlin and multi platform and HTTP 4K is. As as of yet, uh, not much I would say. Um, H4K was definitely built with the JVM in mind only, and most of the HTTP 4K modules are specific to libraries that only exist in the JVM. So it, it is pretty much specific, but. We do have a, a strong interest in multi-platform because we do believe that this basic abstraction of server as a function can be translated to other places. Um, and that's why we are starting to investigate what is possible to translate and what will be the impact if we get just the HP 4K core, for example, and say, if you want this to be available in other platforms, what would it look like and how much impact would it have on the rest of, of the platform? Yeah, and, and to be clear, the, I mean, one of the conditions regarding those uh, grants were either you are, you know, uh, providing a multi-platform or you are working towards multi-platform. Yeah. Um, and to, to make it even more clear, like, uh, we expect this to happen. Otherwise, we will find you. We will hunt <laughs> you down. <laughs> we have Great. a particular set of uh, talents. Yes. I really worry that there's like some some like up and coming library developer out there who just worked up like the the courage uh, to, <laughs> to, uh, to apply for a grant, <laughs> and now they're just panicking. <laughs> like, oh no! Yeah. Well, I think this is interesting because I think one of the, the one of the when we I think we talked about the code teams last time, um, and one of the things that we said we were missing was actually the the support that was added in one. Five, twenty, maybe one six for like extending. Code teams weren't extend, weren't actually supported fully in touch with them. And actually, we'll be interesting. We've got the similar kind of thing going on now, which is the IO library, the multi-platform IO library, which we is kind of gonna kind of form the core of anything we can do. Really, we don't write our own IO library. That's kind of gonna be. That's not our business. We're probably very good at it. So we definitely want to. We want to basically build on something else. So we spoke to Roman. Um, um, a Kotlin company said that there was there was some news on and the the IO library from the multi platform IO library it from uh, JetBrains. Um, can you give us an update on that? It's like what us? You you're asking yeah. us questions now? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean uh, we're working on it. Um, you know, this has been also an effort with uh, with some of the folks that were working on um, OKIO. Uh, so. Um, joint effort to try and standardize on the on the interfaces and and allow at the same time for people to provide different implementations but yeah it's 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 work in progress i can't really i don't know seb if you've got more details to share at this point no that seems to be the 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 current state um i mean it is currently still an alpha and it, but it is exactly like you said the, the 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 joint effort that tries to bring some of the capabilities that the community's already built and uh, kind of bring it under a, a standardized standardized API surface type thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the challenges that we always have with with Kotlin is 
I, I don't want to badmouth other companies, but there are, uh, there are open source ecosystems where a single company seems to push out everything, right? And we really don't want that to be Kotlin. We, we want to be able to kind of foster a community where anybody can write anything and anybody can use anything. And you have to somehow also balance that with people are kind of saying, well, I expect this to be in the box, right? I expect IO to be in the box. And like IO has been one of those ones that people just expect it to be in the box, right? Um, but even if we provide it, we don't want to kind of say, well, this is the only way for you to do IO. If a better library comes out that, that is better for your needs or whatever, please use that. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. And that's the challenge for us as well, because we, we, there are things that we also don't want to build. Like we don't want to build our own daytime library because we depend on that if we go multi-platform, right? So, so we expect them to exist in some shape or form maintained by someone, whether it's JetBrains or not. I, I don't, I'm not particularly interested, but we need to have something that we consider stable enough that we could adopt because that that's one of the things as well that, we wanted from the beginning to keep the core pretty much with no dependencies. Right now, you don't need anything to just start a server or use as a client um, in the JVM. So to go multi-platform, we want to still keep the dependency uh, surface very small, but it does mean that we need to have things that are very stable behind it. Gotcha. Uh, so I do have uh, one more question. I think we can talk a little bit more about about adoption and uh, and your growth because as you as you said, you, you got some pretty impressive numbers and and obviously with that comes the uh, the whole challenge of actually fostering and growing a community. But before that, I want to just take a, a brief little detour about something you you mentioned kind of on the on the side uh, at the beginning. Um, because I do recall the last time we talked, we were talking about coroutines. Um, and you just very casually mentioned that now you have support for Loom. Um, and I'm just curious what the what the story uh, what the story is there. Um, so well, so we do support Loom now, it's a version five. Um, so we can use multi the kind of platform, uh, sorry, the uh, virtual threads. So currently um, I think actually no, there are three engines now. We just we added Helidon, which is the rewrite of um, or Helidon Nemo, which is the Oracle um, backend. Um, so yeah, so now three platforms we do uh, we have backends that we support for that. And then I suppose at the moment, I mean that I mean Lim isn't out yet. Still, what is it October? Now so it's like next month. Finally, after years and years, I, mean, I know we talked about it two years ago. We we mentioned it. Um, and I suppose the, the interesting thing for the, this kind of like the coroutines and, and the multi-platform stuff, I suppose we'll see how it swings out really. So uh, if the coroutines are required in order to in order to get the IO library going, then it, maybe that be a thing we have to do. You know, it's as I said last time, the, the main most important thing to do is DevX. So, you know, developer experience, being able to test things easily, be able to, you know, low maintenance overhead, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. I think I think we're we're very I think thinking about how getting the IO abstraction and and the date time abstraction, uh, kind of those things in first. If we've got a list of things, you can go through the core and you see, you know, you just search for import Java dot, and then you can see all the things that we're that we're relying on. And those are the two big ones. The other ones are I suppose the kind of things like URL encoder and decoder and that kind of stuff from from Java Net. I mean, one of the one of the beautiful things about Kotlin, I think, is, is that especially when you are uh, on projects that are JVM, I mean, there there's nothing wrong with using Loom over over coroutines, right? That's kind of that's a little bit of the the beauty of the whole story. When you when you are using coroutines, you can continue to do that, and you you get the same like underlying abstraction and performance. Um, but when there's when there's APIs that you can build just against Loom. Um, that's that's also perfectly possible. I'm curious, did you do any kind of like benchmarking to see whether uh, you you saw like a, a huge performance increase when when switching to Loom from from just like the regular uh, system thread model of the JVM? I mean, we didn't actually do any ourselves. I think uh, the Jetty guys did, 
some uh, there was something on the line which was Jesse. We're kind of looking at the tech the tech and power benchmarks as our go to. That's our kind of go to for the, you know they've got a big system. They've got two hundred different things. They've got different tests. They've got templating engines and JSON and plain text and database caching because it all exists in a in a in an ecosystem, right? It, it requires. It's no good just saying I can do a hundred thousand threads at once. You need to say, okay, I need to put a hundred thousand threads, and I need to be able to render some JSON, and I need to be able to talk to a database, and I need, you know, so th there's multiple. So the real world tests are what's important, really, not not just kind of isolated benchmarks of I can spin up a hundred thousand things. Um, that's 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 how. Well, we'll see how it goes. I think the next. The next official benchmark, well, the next official benchmark round 21, I think is coming out in, they said in three or four weeks, I think. So we'll see. Bob, just throwing in the uh, Kotlin Foundation grant multi platform co routine. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, don't forget, you know, we, we're we watching you. Anyway, j jokes aside, who said that was a joke, Hardy? No, you did. Anyway, right. Um, I have a question. I want to come back to a topic which we were discussing earlier, which is uh, I've been spending way too much time in Google Sheets lately. Like my life has become all about numbers now. And I want to talk numbers. So you've got 1 million people using uh, your stuff or downloads. Um, your adoption is growing. Kudos. You're two people. You're consultants. You're sustaining this somehow via your consultancy, which is driving you to new uh, potential leads as the authors of HTTP4K. And that's fantastic. And that's wonderful, right? Have you considered the idea of a different model to make your open source library sustainable? <laughs> uh, we, are, we are frequently talking about this, uh, but I think that's one that we also haven't cracked that uh, yet. W what are the models that are feasible for us to switch either to dedicate ourselves purely on H4K as uh, a thing on its own uh, or create something like a company around it that, that goes beyond just sponsorship? Because I think like grants and sponsorships are great, but they're also, it's, it's, a, it's a weird connection about value and how much time is going to be spent on things, right? Uh, the expectations there are, I don't think they're always aligned. Uh, some, sometimes people expect that by donating $100 here, they will get their feature and it's not like that. Um, we still want to have a sustainable uh, way to develop H4K. Uh, and I think we did talk many times about uh, commercial support, right? Like if you do want to have specific modules that are going to be used in the commercial environment and you do need a special level of support, like it would be fair to pay for that. Uh, but we haven't pulled the trigger on that because it, again, also with more than 120 modules, it's really hard to pick like what, which one of them, is there anything that we really even want to make them potentially not open source? If that's like a critical thing that we want to offer. Um, yeah, and and just make sure that you work in a license that doesn't allow some big cloud provider to come and use your stuff and then sub-license it for a fee. Uh, but the reason I ask this is, you know, I'm a big fan of, okay, fan is probably the wrong word. I'm a big advocate for the idea that we need to find an actual sustainable model for open source, which doesn't rely on sponsorship or grants, right? And uh, because, or or GitHub forks or stars. You know, because last time I went to my kid's school, I said, uh, there's like, you, you owe us this money. I'm like, can I pay you in GitHub stars or, or karma, open source karma? It doesn't pay the bills as we all know, right? So, but every time, you know, we talk about this, people say, no, 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 this isn't true open source, meaning I want it for free. Have you considered actually providing a licensing model whereby you could say, for instance, if you are a commercial company using this in a commercial environment, you pay a commercial license, independently of you know support or or specific modules. I mean, as a whole. 
I think we, well, so the, the people have done that, right? So that's yes. interesting. Successfully. And, 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 well, yeah, successfully, but there is also, it's quite interesting because obviously, who's it? I mean, obviously, a light band have done it, right, with DACA. So that wasn't yeah. particularly well received. And it's also like maybe other people, you already know where we live, Paddy. So, you know, we don't want the other people coming in. So, <laughs> bring things at our houses. There's quite a lot of, seriously, there's, you know, Whenever anyone tries to do that, whenever anyone is has the temerity, temerity to, to kind of like, uh, to kind of dare the, to, to ask that somebody maybe pay for a bit of software they're using, the, the reaction online is something like you, you know, it's it's pretty strong. I mean, you know, it's it's quite a. I'm not sure if we're ready for that letting that hate in my life. It's like it's. Uh, oh, trust me. I mean, we, we yeah. There's a lot of hate, but then the question is, you know. Uh, do you want a million people that are using your product and potentially, you know, destroying your livelihood because it's 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 a lot of uh, effort and drain on you to do this at the same time while you're working, or would you prefer ten thousand people using your products in a sustainable way? Oh, definitely, it's definitely it's definitely a consideration. We talk about it all the time, so it's just it's just that kind of finding that. Pulling the trigger, finding the niche, you know. It's, it's, I, I, I strongly it's... believe that we should start to move in this direction because it, it the way it is right now isn't. And we keep pushing ourselves back because we're like, oh, we're going to get a lot of hate. Well, okay. Great. Love doesn't pay the bills, people. It really does not. <laughs> Um, I'm 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 curious though, um, because obviously you've you've started to to grow uh, quite a community and have have quite a lot of users, which uh, isn't something that's that's done easily. Like there's there's a lot of libraries competing for attention. Um, there's always people with strong opinions in one direction over another. Um, so I'm curious. We've already, uh, I guess quality is one of the big things that obviously like factors into it um so as you've already said quality of documentation um making sure that all your examples work um but also just in in your case especially the the quality of the of the underlying abstraction but i'm i'm curious if if you like looking back at it if you are able to identify any things that you say like you've done right with HTTP4K, maybe even with managing its community um, that like helped you helped you grow? I, I would say one thing that we are particularly good at is like we, we listen to the community and adopt changes quite easily, quite quickly. Uh, so th that goes back into the small incremental releases and the fact that everything is so modularized that the risk for us to take someone's feedback and just improving the library and making something is very low. Normally it's low effort. We can do it quickly. We can do a new release. So I think one thing that I would say H4K does well is we can take people's feedback and update the library and evolve it very quickly. Like Dave was saying, someone's playing with Playwright and this is kind of a pattern that people came up with. Uh, we can incorporate, create a new module in a matter of hours, and, and it's out there. So I think we do have this um, connection with people who are using or interested in using uh, and listen to the feedback, which again, it, it goes back to, we can only do that because we do have this freedom, right? Of, of, of it's open source and we do it in our own time. There's no, we don't have a big agenda behind or, or anything that we want to push uh, apart from what people are expecting uh, now with grants and so on. <laughs> I'm really glad you picked up on that one. Thanks. Uh, but I'm 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 curious because obviously the like the more people you have, you you might also just have like forces pulling in in multiple like different directions. Like some people have an idea that they would like the library to behave or or support this thing, and, and other people. Want to have maybe the the opposite or, or have a similar approach? How do you how do you reconcile this, or is this something that doesn't doesn't come up often, uh, that often? <laughs> right then, then it would have we would have done that. Um, is it right at the time? No. Would it be right in the future? Maybe. But you know, we have to think about 
how it's going to affect people that are using it because there are like a million downloads. So, and even if we do a major release, we you know try and not break things as much as possible. Um, but I think the thing, the thing of keeping everything so simple is it kind of allows that to, you're not building complexity on top of the complexity. So the actual abstractions, as long as you find the right abstractions for the particular things, and the underlying model is so trivially simple that it's actually, it's, it's quite amazing how much power you can get out of something so ridiculously simple. And it, it constantly surprises us. It's so, like, oh my God, this, you can do this as well. Um, I mean, even if we, when we did like the server side events and um, um, server sent events and, and WebSockets, it was still like, oh, we can do this with functions and we can actually test WebSockets in memory without actually spinning up a server, which is actually something I still haven't seen anywhere else, which is interesting. So just by, instead of building complexity on complexity, which is so tempting, especially for lots of library offers, obviously to do something clever, it's like trying to, the real, for us, the really clever thing is keeping it simple and actually, you know, making it so everything is still ultimately really testable and really quick and the developer experience is really good. Um, that's, it's for us, that's the most important thing. And at the end of the day, it is also, once again, it's, we built this thing for us eventually, right? That, that's kind of, because we deliver software to, to our clients. So that's, and we can come in and build stuff software quickly and, and well. So that's ultimately is the, that's how it started. And that's kind of how it kind of remains at the moment, at least. So it's interesting that you mentioned about complexity and building on complexity and how this is trying to keep things simple. And at the same time, you said that most of your work as a consultant is building microservices, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you classify microservices as something that has become overly complex for no apparent reason at times? Absolutely. And the, and the funny thing is that we've, we've, you know, the industrial machine has convinced the world that that, that that is required. And it's just, and it's just simply not true. And it, actually the amusing thing is that people are really surprised that, that, that you, you don't have to do complicated things in order to actually get working software. Because all the examples they see online are all complex <laughs> annotation reflection, blah, 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 you know, you know, massive build tool chains. I mean, Kotlin's actually pretty good for that. But if you look at something like, you know, the JavaScript tool chain, for example, it's just, I'm sure it's not as bad as it used to be, but it used to be quite insane. Um, it's just, so I think people, it's refreshing to people just don't expect that you can do it because we've built up this kind of aura of being able to only do things that's really hard. Okay, but, but please confess to me, tell me, has anyone ever asked you, should one of my HTTP 4K functions be its own microservice? Have you ever had that conversation? Um, I don't think so. No, but I mean, but that, fundamentally, that is that's the example. On, that is literally the example on on the front page. It's like here's a, here's a here's a, a function. It returns hello world. Stick it as a server, and that's that's your microservice. So, yeah. Uh, to 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 also give reference for folks that might not be aware, back in the old days in the .NET community. Um, there was a famous architect author that that came up with the idea that every class should be its own service. Uh, so every function should be its own microservice. Kind of, you get it. Yeah, never mind. Okay. I, I well. think there's a there's a very fun uh, talk from a semi recent Ruby conference where um, they have made every function invocation in the Ruby standard library its own microservice, and that includes constructor calls. So constructing a new object spawns a new AWS service that, that you can then interact with. It's terribly slow, uh, as it turns out. It's also terribly expensive, as it turns out. Uh, not nearly pragmatic for anything, but extremely entertaining to watch. I hope I'll can uh, I'll, I'll have to look uh, look that up and hopefully put that in the show notes as well. Um, yeah. How we moved to serverless and uh, paid two million dollars to exactly. <clears throat> well, it's great from Major Rift's perspective, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, but but just so that we can just to round out this this argument on on complexity versus simplicity, or you know, complex things don't have to be be hard um, or or hard to manage. Is there any part, uh, or is there is there any situation where? Um, you say like people have 
overused HTTP 4K, or they said like there's a there's a use case that is so complex or that requires so much structure um, that that traditional approaches would actually be more beneficial over the simple abstraction, or or have you found that the uh, that the server as a function of abstraction hold holds no matter like how far you push it? Uh, in my experience, the the server as a function itself uh, it, it holds very strongly in terms of it's simple. You can compose that in, in different ways. I think where in that part, I'd say in the user experience, especially if you're starting with simple services and so on, is is it works fine. I think that that we, we haven't seen any problem with that. I think where we see the problem, and it's another topic that we keep discussing, is that as as an application growth and now you need database, you need the queue, you need like a cache, and now you need this and you need that. Uh, how people structure uh, configuring an application, uh, it, it, it may become messy. And that's the part that like, we, we strongly believe from the beginning that we didn't want to provide a framework, right? We just want people to get the bits they need and they you wire them together and you put them to work. Um, but we do see that if people are not used to that model where like I use my constructor and I actually structure my dependencies in such a way to create that uh, application, uh, it is not that difficult to also make a mess. Um, so the, the trade-off there is that we expect people to understand how to construct bigger applications if you're dealing with that kind of complexity um, because we don't provide that uh, so a solution for that out of the box. And that's also where people like Dave and I, we already know the patterns that work and how you can do that in a sustainable way as well. Are those patterns by any chance also part of your documentation or do you provide people with, with guidance in, in how they should structure their, their apps? Uh, not really. I think the closest to it, I think it was our uh, our talk at Kotlin Conf, I think is, is, is the closest to what's kind of the state of the art of how do we structure bigger applications around H4K. Dave, would that be fair or is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of it's to do with not just one application as well. So we 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 well we we big advocates of uh, like monorepos um, and kind of multi-service testing, um, where you're kind of uh, testing lots of applications and spending them all up in memory at once in one you know, and that actually allows you to do conversely amusingly less testing. So there are very much some patterns that to, to put in place. And we, in the if you go and look at the talk we did, Cotton Cop, it's you know. What works in the small works in the large as well, because it's just the same patterns applied again and again. Um, but we haven't written them down. Um, it does form a part of our consultancy practice, of course, the social source. Um, and if we ever did do a framework, then maybe we'd do a framework around that. But but, uh, oh, but having just told me we've got to charge for that, so I'm not sure how to do that. Gotcha. And I guess yeah. I guess people can look that up also in the uh, in the talk from from Colin Conf. That's all. cool. Cool. Well, uh, it's been great having you folks on the show. Uh, we are kind of out of time, and, and we keep saying this, Seb, and we still don't have a definition of how long our episodes last. That's right? correct. But I know that when it hits the hour mark, it's kind of like, yeah, we're out of time. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's been great having you. Once again, congratulations on having won one of the prizes for the Kotlin Foundation on behalf, this is where I get serious, on behalf of uh, JetBrains, the Kotlin Foundation, and the whole community, thank you for your contributions uh, to the Kotlin community. Uh, but uh, also, we'll be checking up on you. Put that put that money <laughs> to good use, yeah? <laughs> like, yeah if, if you see Hadi with like binoculars outside your window, don't be surprised. You know, when you filled out the form and it asked for your address, there was a reason for that. <laughs> uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna scare off some other library developers with this stuff. Hadi's not being serious. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I'm never I'm never serious. Never. There's a just some healthy ambiguity in everything he says. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much um for uh for being with us today uh, Ivan and David and of course thank you so much uh everyone who who tuned in to this episode um let us know what you thought of this let us know if you tried http 4k maybe uh in the comments and of course do all the other social media interactions that I'm too tired to list um but you know them by now yeah 
Awesome stuff. So I, th I think we already collected a couple of different places of where people can uh, find HTTP4K related materials. One of them being, of course, the, the previous show, uh, your your talk, and uh, I guess also just the homepage, I would assume, just HTTP4K.org. Yeah. yeah, if you go through there, there, there's kind of an inaction page that's got lists of the various kind of materials and yeah, checks and Lot. You can just scroll out and find out everything from there. Oh, very cool. This page I didn't know about yet. The HTTP4K in action. We're also going to add that one to the show notes. Awesome stuff. Yeah, cool. So um, thanks so much again, Dave and Ivan. And, uh, Thank you, guys. And we hope to see all of you in a future Thank episode. you. Yes, where Seb is actually accustomed to the European time zone. Right, Seb? Oh, who knows if that's ever going to happen. Who knows? <laughs> Probably. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.